Hi, it's Dr. Z. In this video, I will review decision errors that can occur in hypothesis testing. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain the possible outcomes in hypothesis testing and compare and contrast type 1 and type 2 errors. Please print the corresponding handout for this video and feel free to pause the video at any time to take notes on the handout. Recall that hypothesis testing is the heart of conducting research. In a hypothesis test, we conduct a research study with a sample and then decide if the sample supports a hypothesis about a population. In step four of hypothesis testing, we make one of two decisions to decide if the study worked or not. We either decide to reject the null hypothesis, which means the study worked, or we make the decision to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means the study did not work. Unfortunately, sometimes we can make an error in making this decision. This video will explain what these decision errors are. Since my favorite pie is pumpkin pie, I'll be using pie as an example to explain the uncertainty that can occur in hypothesis testing. Imagine that the whole pumpkin pie is the population. To test if the whole population tastes good, we would technically have to eat the whole pie. Is eating the whole pie for the sake of research a good idea? Well, no it is not, even if you love eating pie like I do. Rather, we should eat a slice of the pie to determine if the whole pie tastes good. In other words, we're making a decision on the whole pie based on a slice of pie. This analogy is exactly how hypothesis testing works. Now in reality, the sample, or a pie slice, provides only limited or incomplete information about the population, or the whole pie. Therefore, we honestly always have a possibility of making an incorrect conclusion or making an error in step four of hypothesis testing. This diagram uses the analogy of pumpkin pie to explain the possible outcomes in hypothesis testing. Remember, you're using a sample to answer questions about the population. The left side of the diagram is a decision that you make based on the slice of pie. The top of the diagram reflects the reality of the situation, or what the whole pie really looks like. There are four possible outcomes. First, you ate this slice of pie here and made the decision that the whole pie was good based on this particular slice. But in reality, that slice came from this ugly burnt pie. In other words, you made an error in your decision. We said that the pie was good, but in reality, it was not good. Second, you ate this slice of pie again and made the decision that the whole pie was good based on this particular slice. Well, in reality, that slice came from this beautiful, tasty pie. In other words, you're correct in your decision. We said the pie was good, and in reality, the pie was good. Third, you ate this burnt slice of pie and made the decision that the whole pie was not good based on this particular slice. Well, guess what? In reality, that slice came from this ugly burnt pie here. In other words, you are correct in your decision. We said the pie was not good, and in reality, it was not good. Fourth, you ate this burnt slice of pie again and made the decision that the whole pie was not good based on this particular slice. Now guess what? In reality, that slice came from this beautiful tasty pie here. In other words, you made an error in your decision. We said the pie was not good, but in reality, it was good. Basically, when conducting a hypothesis test, there are two outcomes that are correct, meaning you made the correct decision based on the sample, and there are two outcomes that are errors, meaning that you made the incorrect decision based on the sample. Let's discuss in more detail about these decision errors. 
I imagine some of you are thinking right now, well, after all that work learning about hypothesis testing, I might have been doing it wrong. Let me assure you, you're doing nothing wrong. Decision errors happen when the right procedures lead to the wrong decisions. As a researcher, you can control the sample, but you cannot control the population. The definition of decision errors attempts to explain the situation. The reality is that we do not know the entire population we're studying, and sometimes mistakes can happen. Let's describe these two decision errors. The first error is called a type 1 error. This happens when the re researcher rejects the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. So what does that really mean? Recall that the decision to reject the null hypothesis means that we said the study worked or something happened. If the null hypothesis is the prediction that nothing worked or nothing happened, and the null hypothesis is true, that means nothing really happened after all. If we were to translate this, in other words, we said something happened, but in reality, nothing happened. From a researcher perspective, they concluded that the treatment had an effect, when it in fact has no effect at all. Ouch. Basically, they said the drug worked, but it really doesn't work. Now, let me ask you a question. How serious of an error is a type 1 error? If your mom was taking a drug that would help her get better, and then you found out that that researcher had a type 1 error, would you be upset? That means that drug that's supposed to help her actually isn't. This is a pretty serious error. Since a type 1 error is a serious one to make, why does this error happen? The main reason is due to the sample. For some unknown reason, the sample was misleading. Let's use an, a real life example of a breast cancer drug. A breast cancer drug can work with a particular sample whose participants might just happen to have the same cancer gene that the drug is meant to target. And if you were to repeat the study with a different sample with maybe different gene components in the participants, you may get a different result. There are two consequences of a type 1 error. Researchers love to publish results that show their scientific study worked, so false findings get published. These findings are used as basis for future research and other researchers act on this information. Often it is many years down the road when we find out that results were not accurate in the first place, but it's often too late. In statistical notation, we refer to the probability of a type 1 error as the Greek letter alpha. Alpha is another way of saying the significance level, or p. Recall in step 2 of our hypothesis testing that we need to set criteria to make a decision. The researcher sets the significance level either 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Well, guess what? The researcher controls the probability of making a type 1 error by setting this alpha or setting the significance level p. At this point, some students then ask me, why don't we just set our significance level lower than 0 0.05 so that we don't make a type 1 error? Excellent question. The answer is, well, the smaller the alpha, or the smaller the significance level p, the harder it is to reach those critical regions. This graph shows the critical regions of alpha or significance level 0.05 and 0.01. With an alpha of 0.05, the critical region here is much bigger than with the alpha of 0.01. As a researcher, we must balance the need to reduce type 1 error with a realistic to reach critical region. Now let's review the second error, which is called a type 2 error. This happens when the researcher fails to reject the null hypothesis, when in fact it is false. Well, what does that really mean? 
Remember that a decision to fail to reject the null hypothesis means that we said the study did not work or that nothing happened. If the null hypothesis is a prediction that nothing worked or nothing happened, and the null hypothesis is false, that means that something did happen after all. So if you were to translate that, in other words, we said nothing happened, but in reality, something happened. From a researcher perspective, a treatment effect does exist, but the hypothesis test failed to detect it. Uh-oh, basically they said the drug did not work, but the drug really does work. Now, let me ask you a question. How serious of an error is a type 2 error? Most students at this point may first say it's not as serious as a type 1 error. However, I challenge you to think about it this way. If your mom or your dad or your grandma or your nana had cancer, and a drug that actually does work was thrown out and not used at all, how would you feel? I personally believe that a type 2 error is equally as serious as a type 1 error. The reason that a type 2 error happens is often due to the treatment effect. The treatment effect is small, and so the z-score for the sample does not fall in the critical region. In these cases, sample size is critically important. There are two consequences to a type 2 error. As I stated before, researchers love to publish studies that show that their study worked. Thus, unfortunately, data that show that the treatment did not work are not usually published. These non-statistically significant results and the corresponding drugs or treatments about them are discarded and not usually continued. In some fortunate cases, researchers will accept the result and move on or accept the result and try again. Now that we we've reviewed the two decision errors that occur in a hypothesis testing. Let's put this all together in the diagram that we used before for the pumpkin pie analogy. A type 1 error occurs when we said the treatment worked, but in reality the treatment did not work. The decision we made is correct when we said the treatment worked, and in reality the treatment did work. We made another correct decision when we said the treatment did not work, and in reality, the treatment did not work. Finally, we made a type two error when we said the treatment did not work, but in reality, the treatment did work. After reviewing the four possible outcomes in a hypothesis testing, as well as type one and type two errors, are you ready to practice your new knowledge? I have one practice example for you to review. This lecture example will give you an opportunity to practice explaining the decision for the four possible outcomes in hypothesis testing. The details of this research study are also provided in your video handout. A social psychologist wants to know whether visible tattoos decrease physical attractiveness. The psychologist is testing a directional hypothesis because they're predicting the direction or a decrease in physical attractiveness. In complete sentences, using the variables in the lecture example, I want you to write a sentence that describes each of the four possible outcomes in hypothesis testing to complete this diagram that you've seen already twice before. Please do not simply write in correct or an error. To make it easier for you, I recommend that you use shortening the variables to VT for visible tattoos and PA for physical attractiveness. The wording of these sentences should resemble the wording from the previous diagram. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to write the four outcomes on your own first then resume the video to show the answers. First, 
This is a type 1 error, where we said the study worked, but it really didn't. Using the variables in the lecture example, and using a directional hypothesis, the sentence would be, visible tattoos decrease physical attractiveness, but in reality, visible tattoos do not decrease physical attractiveness. Second, this is a correct decision. The sentence would be, visible tattoos decrease physical attractiveness, and in reality, visible tattoos do decrease physical attractiveness. Third, this is our other correct decision. The sentence would be, visible tattoos do not decrease physical attractiveness, and in reality, visible tattoos do not decrease physical attractiveness. And our fourth outcome is a type 2 error, where we said the study did not work, but in reality, it did work. The sentence here would be, visible tattoos do not decrease physical attractiveness, but in reality, visible tattoos do decrease physical attractiveness. In summary, there are four possible outcomes in hypothesis testing. Two of these outcomes can lead to decision errors, known as type 1 and type 2 errors. It is important for researchers to continue to build on or to continue with conducting scientific studies despite having the potential for errors in hypothesis testing.